I want to welcome you to the second half of the symposium. Some of you have maybe missed the opening, so I just want to characterize what this second half is about. So you can see the run of the show on the agenda, but many of you might have missed the opening comments. So the next panels all engage the arts writ large, and whatever they are, since we were talking about that last time, to questioning just what it mean, what we might, we might mean by the human and humanity at the putative center of human-centered AI. So how might experiments in sound movement, performance, and music, for example, challenge traditional ideas about both art and tech? And how might arts informed by disability activism reframe normative conceptions of the body and of the medical model of the human informing a lot of AI assistive technology, as well as common thinking about optimization and performance? So I am the MC for the second half, and what I do is I inter, um, I introduce the moderators who will introduce the panel. So, and I'm gonna, I'm, I, we have very short bios, but it's worth mentioning a few because as I mentioned at the outset, this is a mad collision of people with very different backgrounds and disciplinary, so it's worth listening to them. Even if you don't recognize some of them, you'll recognize others. So Katie Kwan is an engineer, researcher, and artist. She's a pioneer in the nascent field of choreo robotics. She recently defended her PhD thesis. Yay, where are you? Yay in the mechanical engineering department at Stanford University where she completed a master's of science in mechan oh, I already said that mechanical engineering her research and artistic work focuses on robot learning imitation learning human robot interaction and dance Katie's a prolific robot choreographer having created artworks with nearly a dozen different robots and has held artistic residencies at the Smithsonian Everyday Robots from Google X Thoughtworks Arts and TED please welcome Katie who will welcome our the rest of our panel Thank you, Michelle. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope it was a joyous lunch. Our Northern California weather is coming through. Uh, it is an absolute honor and privilege to introduce two of my very close friends, uh, collaborators, colleagues, real visionaries, and I hope we're gonna have a great discussion with some very rich Q&A. Uh, Ken Goldberg is a professor of engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. He has a joint appointment in art, and he's also a prolific artist, so please welcome Ken Goldberg. And then I have to introduce Sydney. <laughs> um, and then Sydney's. <laughs> so well done. Um, and then Sydney Skyvetter is a professor of theater, arts, and performance studies at Brown University and is a choreographer. So please welcome them both. Okay, that, I'm sure that won't be the, the, the last clumsy move I make up here. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for, for inviting me and uh, Michelle, James, and Katie for, for including me in this, in this panel. And I'm really delighted to be here with, with uh, some peop someone like Sydney and Katie who are so knowledgeable about dance. Now I am not, okay, so I am, let me just get that out of the right way. I am not a dancer myself, um, but I have worked with a number of dancers. and. <clears throat> I wanted, to, um, I wanted to talk a little bit, this morning, I loved all the conversations and I really took, I learned a lot, I took it to heart about how AI is impacting the arts. And I wanted to just try a little bit, before I give you some examples of my own work, to talk about the other side, with the arts, how the arts might impact AI. And so this is gonna be a little controversial, but um, here's my thinking is that we have, been, we have been hearing a steady drumbeat of negativity that has been coming out um, you can try the next slide, if you would. That has been just, um, well, I have my theory about why that's happening. I mean, if you have a question, I can explain. But I, I think we need to counter this. Because artists, for the most part, my friends who are artists and my friends who are, who are really the most creative engineers and, and scientists, they're, 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 they, they accept, oh, I can do it myself, OK. Um, <laughs> They accept the, um, the reality of this big step, which is no doubt, this is a big, um, big moment and, uh, and, 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 and paradigm shift in a sense. Uh, but at the same time, they're super excited about it and suddenly thinking all about the many positive sides and the things they might be able to do with it. So, you know, there's all of this negativity. I think that um, I don't want to downplay or sound insensitive to it, but it's, it's important. But I also think that artists, uh, have a kind of opportunity to counter this kind of uh, this 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 just unbelievably Armageddon view 
And there's a little glimmers of this. Even the New York Times had something positive buried deeply in the, one of their sections recently. There's a new book out um, that, uh, that is just coming out, Power and Progress, that uh, has some positive perspectives. Sal Khan came out last, very recently with a, with a TED talk saying that you know, he really sees an upside of personalized tutoring for, for students all over the world. This is another article that was in the information this week about uh, the, 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 the visual effects workers, who are kind of nerds to begin with, right? They love this, uh, this, the, the generative AI, and they're playing with it and trying to figure out what they can do with it. So I think that's an, it's sort of a, something that the, um, that, we, that the artist community can, can share with the, can, can do constructively for this field. And you know, here's another example. This is just a, you know, just from Mid Journey, right? These images are incredible. And this is my favorite one. Um, I, I've actually been, been coming around to thinking that this, this could be creative. There's a famous creativity test. Many of you know. Think of the many uses for a brick. So I tried it out with 100 creative uses for a guitar pick, which I did search online. And I didn't find any any of that on there. But this is what it came up with. And you know, it's kind of, it's kind of good. And I think that I'm going to go out and, and say that I, I think that there's a, there's a possibility, there's a glimmer of, of, of creativity in, uh, in, in artificial creativity that we're starting to see. And it's not the same as human creativity. It's not. And it thinks, you know, compl the, the operations are very different than human thinking. And I, I want to really be careful about that analogy because I think it's very dangerous. But it's something different, and I think it's something really interesting and worth us taking stock of and thinking about as, as, as creators and thinking what we can do with it, how we might collaborate with it. So I've been, my own work has been in robotics, which is relevant to this, to this panel on, on embodiment and motion. And so robots are kind of where AI meets the mind-body problem. It's uh, where you actually move out into the physical realm. So I know we, I see, I'm looking around, I see a number of roboticists, uh, Osama Khatib in the back, Eric Paulos over here. There's a number of, um, a great amount of robotics research going on um, uh, here and, uh, and across the bay at, uh, at Berkeley. And um, so, but I've always been interested in, in how we can use that to raise questions about the technology itself. So when the internet came out in 95, my students and I built this, uh, this system is really, we were thinking of as an art installation called the Telegarden, and it allowed anyone on the internet to um, reach and activate a real living garden from their, from their browsers. Um, Golan showed, showed an early uh, image from, uh, uh, from the internet. This is, a, this is a mosaic browser, and it's showing where um, you could go in and you could move around by clicking on your screen, and it would show you the garden. Then you could also um, plant and water seeds. And the, so this was online for nine years. It was, uh, it was attended at the um, Ars Electronica Museum, which was also mentioned this morning. And um, <clears throat> so I was interested in, in a lot of issues that came up out of this about the questions of veracity and what we call telepistemology. Uh, that that word never caught on, but uh, <laughs> um, but it was it was interesting. And then what, one of the things that happened was we we um, we didn't expect how how many people would use it, and th so it became a study ultimately in the tragedy of the commons that we saw how many people had been using this, and that you couldn't sustain many people in a garden of that na of that size. Uh, we later then did a version of a Ouija board, um, again a great scientific instrument. Um, where we, we, we had a robotic system and people could access it from, by putting their hands on their own mouse from all over the world. And then we did, um, I, I did a project where we took the sound, the seismic signal from the Earth. And this was 2006, so it was a 100 year anniversary of the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. And so we, um, we, we, I worked with a dancer, Muriel Maffre from the SF Ballet. And we did a performance where we took the sound and then sonified it. Using um, using some a number of sound tools, and um, so Ballet Mori was performed there a hundred years almost exactly to to the date of the earthquake, and uh, I'll just show you a quick sample of that.
So what's interesting here is that uh, ballet is a very um, ballet is a very very rigorous um, art, and it's usually there's no room for for, for, for variation, right? There's not a lot of, there's not much improv in a ballet, but yet this was all improv. She didn't know what the earth was gonna do that evening, and when we went live, um, you know, she had practiced extensively, but we didn't know how the earth, the earth was gonna respond. So it was very brave of her to be able to get up there and, and do this motions, um, basically in response to what she was hearing, we were all hearing in real time. I've also had the great pleasure to work with Katie, and we are working right now on a piece that I'll show you um, a, a very quick sample of that's in progress. And the idea here is that we were able to use some of the new motion capture uh, advances to capture her motions in doing performing dance. Then we transferred that onto a robot arm, and then she responded. She came into the, to the lab, responded to the robot, and then we recorded again her motions, used that new recording to then um, tr uh, use those new, that new data to train the robot, and then we iterated. So um, this is what it looks like, and you'll see the human trajectory on the left and the robot trajectory on the right, and then you'll see her. Maybe turn this up a little bit if you can. give um, Katie credit because it's really her responsiveness, her emotional physicality that's re reacting to those motions. And then she came up with the brilliant idea of extending it into a duration piece. So the next phase of this is that we're going to try and do it for nine hours. So we're going to record her for nine hours trying to keep up with the robot and, uh, and just watch that sort of progression of, of, of fatigue. Um, as it evolves, which I think I'm always interested in this contrast between the, the, the digital and the natural world. The last project I'll just mention is something that's also in, in progress. This is joint with uh, Tiffany Schlein, my wife, and uh, this is going to be in this, the PST show, um, the, the Pacific Standard Time show that the Getty organizes. And um, this is going to be based on data. For, we're, we're, this is collabor collaboration with a group at Google that we're taking data um, from the various sources and building this, trying to build a living tree map, uh, a little portrait of the, of the trees in Los Angeles, which has never been seen before. So that's an ongoing process, and I can talk, talk to you more about it. But it's, again, about this idea of physical interaction with, um, with the environment. Thank you. Uh, greetings, uh, nerds. Uh, for those uh, listening in today, uh, I am a uh, tattooed white man with uh, asymmetrical facial hair and Slavic eye circles. Um, I am wearing a blue collared shirt uh, and uh, blue jeans and rocking garish yellow dad shoes. Um, first, um, before I go any further, I want to uh, thank uh, Michelle, James, Casey, and the team um, for the invitation to speak in such excellent company. Y'all are the best, thank you. Um, I also, of course, wish to thank the facilitator of this small group, uh, the inimitable Dr. Katie Kwan, uh, and my interlocutor, the nerd supreme, Professor Ken Goldberg. Uh, I look forward to our discussion. Um, I'm here today to talk about choreo robotics, which, of course, is a portmanteau of choreography and robotics. Um, to be etymology douchebag for just a minute, um, choreography is itself a contraction of a Greek root, uh, chorea, as in uh, chorus, meaning roughly, altogether moving or dancing, and an English suffix, meaning to write, annotate, or encode. 
the word robot, meaning while, uh, meanwhile, is famously derived from the Czech robota, meaning ro forced labor or slave. And so in the subfield of choreo robotics, we are definitionally concerned with how bodies move, how movements are encoded, how those encodings are performed, and how those performances interface with power. So dancing robots is basically my field of research. Uh, and choreo robotics is, I recently promised my tenure committee, totally 100% definitely a thing. Um, it is also totally 100% definitely a thing that a gaggle of nerds very recently made up. Um, if nothing else, choreo robotics as an interdisciplinary subfield at the inter intersection of choreographic theory and robotic motion planning offers a rich, critical aperture to consider how bodies in motion, human or otherwise, move through space and time to generate meaning. It also gives us a useful vantage to understand, for example, whatever the hell is happening. Here. As you might recall, about two years ago, Elon Musk took the stage at the Tesla AI conference to announce recent progress from the Optimus Bipedal Robotics Program. Can we turn the sound down just a little bit? It's going to get ugly. Um, after introductory remarks, Musk brought on stage a dancer dressed like a robo-minion from the then recent film The Mitchells vs. the Machines. Bear in mind that The Mitchells vs. the Machines is a satire of Elon Musk. Anyway, this human acting like a robot enters the space as a robot stereotypically might, with stiff limbs reminiscent of daft punk music videos. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, this dancer slash robot does, among other things, a cakewalk. The cakewalk. Echoing uh, black feminist uh, dance theorist Brenda Dixon Gothschild, the cakewalk, as the dance historically minded of us might recall, is a minstrel dance that originates in the 19th century within black and enslaved communities that is literally a satire of white antebellum ball culture. This is to say that what we have here is a human acting like a robot doing a dance that became popular with white people without them realizing the dance was making fun of them. After about a minute of this, Musk seems to get bored and kind of shoos the dancer away. He then goes on to talk about how we, his audience of presumed technocratic elites, don't need to worry about robot uprisings because his robots are gonna be friendly. Musk promises that by dint of our superior strength, speed, and intelligence, we will always be able to overpower any robot uprising. Recall here again, the root of the word robot is slave. This is an example of what the kids would call a self-own and an object lesson in what theorist Christopher Grobe, who is seated right there, um, hi, sir, um, what he might call bot face. Roughly, the use of robotic performance to reify and extend the violent appropriation of blackness into emergent technological domains using the racist logic of blackface. I'm gonna try and turn this off now. Any time. Would be not soon enough. The one in the middle, right? Oh, the big green. See, I'm colorblind. That's funny. Thank you for that. I appreciate you. <laughs> um, this Tesla example, of course, is uh, neither the only commingling of dance and corporate robotics, nor is it unique in its robotic embodiment of black vernacular and social dance. Consider this. Now canonical, hey, it worked, that's amazing, thank you again. Um, consider this now canonical Choreo Robotic performance from 2018 when DARPA-funded robotics company Boston Dynamics released a YouTube video featuring a quadrupedal dog robot Spot dancing to a cover of Bruno Mars's Uptown Funk. The video was, at the time, astonishing. This impressively dexterous, four-legged robot managed to balance itself while moving energetically with precise rhythmic, uh, with rhythmic precision through a series of intricate movements sourced from the black performance tradition, twerking, the running man, the moonwalk, all seamlessly choreographed and performed by a robot to a song sung by a man of color written by a white British dude about selling cocaine in Harlem, as you do. This was the first choreo robotic performance I ever really studied. After watching it a dozen or so times, I sent an email to info at bostondynamics.com, not really expecting anyone to reply to the effect of, hi, I'm a choreographer, and you're a military-adjacent robotics company. Literally, what the hell are you doing? Within hours, I got an email back from Mark Raybert, the founder of the place, saying, and this is a quote, 
Sure, Uptown Spot was good, but we want to do more. More dancing steps, more types of robots, multiple robots dancing together, robots and people, and perhaps some big production videos. Do you know any choreographers in the Boston area who might want to work with us? Spoiler alert, I did. <laughs> Today, I'm dean of the curriculum at Brown University. But back in 2018, I was junior, non-tenure track faculty uh, trying to find other nerds interested in weird-ass art technology shit. One of my colleagues, robotics professor Stephanie Telex, very charitably showed me around her lab, and we started tinkering with the idea of a choreo robotics course, a class to teach our students, yes, how to, cool, uh, how to do cool dance shit with robots, but also to invite them to consider their adjacency and implication in military industrial research taking place at Brown. Stephanie won a huge grant from the Navy with which she bought two spot robots. We worked with a team of 20 undergraduate and graduate researchers to make a new class titled Choreo Robotics 0101. It takes, thank you seven people who laughed at that. <laughs> I appreciate you all. Just gonna move on. Um, it equally takes place in the dance studio and the robot lab with a sous-son of embodied ethics and intersectional feminist theory. Again, as you do. Uh, these spot robots, though, are fascinating objects, not only for their material existence, but for the software that governs them. I don't have time today to talk about the choreographic interfaces that power the robotic motion planning, but suffice to say, the software is a rich um, tapestry of dancerly material. This, by the way, this torque movement is from the SDK. Race is baked in at the software level. It's not subtle. But we're here today to talk about creativity and artificial intelligence. Why am I talking about dancing robots? Fair question. Well, surely you're all familiar with OpenAI and its most famous product, ChatGPT. Sure. But how many of you are familiar with OpenAI's collaboration with robotics company, 1X, and their recent announcement of a new humanoid robot, robot titled Neo? You know, like Neo, the messianic, eth uh, messianic, ethnically ambiguous main character from the film, The Matrix. You know, the one intended as a warning against AI. Anyway, OpenAI isn't calling the thing a robot, though. Oh, no, they're calling it an AI embodiment because they did not finish the movie. <laughs> Tesla is thinking along similar lines. At a shareholder meeting a week ago, Elon Musk showed off heavily edited footage of Optimus walking constipatedly around <laughs> and narrated how its operating system is intended to be a transferable AI, an intelligence that can be moved from robotic body to body, agnostic as to whether that embodiment is in the shape of a bipedal robot or a car or otherwise. Consider then this operational hypothesis, that robotic bodies are increasingly the expressive art articulation of artificial intelligences. Consider how these artificial intelligences, through the movement and performance of their robotic enclosures, demonstrate the encoding of racist hierarchies through dance. Consider what it means for Elon Musk, a man with the moral character and aesthetic complexity of a gordita crunch wrap, to talk about the future of labor while wearing an illustration of two robot hands forming a heart. For now, contemporary robot dances are laboriously choreographed by humans. A single minute of choreography on a spot takes hours and hours of coding time. Those Boston Dynamics videos take hundreds of engineer hours and cost millions of dollars. The appropriative and citational maneuvers of those creative processes, though, are straightforward and easily traced. Soon, though, the robots will make their own moves, or at least appear to. Last month, here at Stanford, CS professor Karen Liu published a paper documenting a method using generative AI to create an avatar capable of improvising physically plausible movements. Affective and rhythmic analysis are built in. It literally creates an avatar grounded in real-world physics that can respond to musical and emotional cues. This system, true to precedent, seems to have been trained on hip-hop. We're doing similar motion planning research. This is, by the way, from the, um, her website, uh, the EDGE uh, uh, research uh, paper and website. Um, we're doing similar motion planning research uh, for our robots at Brown. 
where we're using virtual environments to train robotic systems to perform tasks and, of course, to dance. The next step, and this is months, not years away, is to combine generative choreographic systems with virtualized robotic motion planning that will enable the robots to improvise in real life. This is, at least, this is literally what I'm hoping will be the conclusion of our next Choreo Robotics course. We bring a live audience into a dance theater, uh, the lights come up, revealing a phalanx of spot robots. We turn on the music, and without any preset choreography per se, the robots begin to improvise, to dance of their own accord. At least, that's what it'll look like, probably for a margin of a few seconds or minutes, until the robots fall down, probably into one another, like the most expensive artificially intelligent dominoes in the world, and then catch on fire, but that's okay, we have an extensive fire extinguisher budget. Generative systems, robotic and otherwise, reiterate the patterns of their training data. A robot seemingly making itself dance doesn't absent the resulting performance from complex interrelation with race and history. Additionally, training robots to improvise isn't only useful in performance. In classic dual-use fashion, it also makes robots more agile warfighters. Choreo robotics then, as a field, balances across representation and violence, aesthetic innovation and technological advancement. It's work that insists on implication within systems that, frankly, I would sooner dismantle. But I think what it means to be an artist today is to work within the world we occupy to imagine other, better worlds, and to use coalitional creativity as a means to critique and contest visions of our shared future that are uninterested in the work towards justice. Laurel Lawson and I recently got a Creative Capital Award to further this effort, specifically to use military and military-adjacent technologies, especially robots, especially AIs, in the service of performance, and to create an imaginative plane that resists hegemonic aims. This project is titled The Choreo Daemonic Platform. Choreo, as in choreography, daemon, as in a background process. The thing will be an experimental gambit, powered by embodied AIs. More functionally, it is the planful articulation of our want for a future of performance to come from within the field rather than as a result of inadvertent design decisions from without. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your talks. I hope my microphone is on. It yep. sounds like it is. Um, this is such a rich beginning to what seemed like a never-ending list of infinitely conflicting questions. So I really appreciate both of you providing so much beautiful expertise. Um, I wrote down a couple of things that you were both speaking about. And I want to maybe discuss something that feels germane to this discussion about generative AI, which is this sort of reiteration of patterns inside of training data. However, when we talk about the training data that's applied for generating new motions for robots, we're often talking about training data that's been human derivative. So we're looking at videos of human beings, or we're watching human demonstrations or human examples, and we're somehow trying to map and take what is the granular nugget of the motion from some source and remap that onto a robot. Two questions about that process in specific. The first one, at what point can we extend beyond the mastery of our training data, specifically in a somatic or kinesthetic sense? Are we able to and capable of moving beyond, perhaps physically, what we've actually been able to observe, especially with an embodied sense? I think that's number one. And then the second one, what exactly, and Ken's talked about this extensively with the sim to real gap, what exactly is lost in the transference of movement from one body into the next, and how might the structure of a network or a process that facilitates that inhibit or create more shading from this transference of one body to another? Mm. Ken? <laughs> you, take the first, you take the first one. OK. Um, so this, this question about, uh, which was about the training data and moving beyond its... Exactly sure. right. As a dancer, you train for 20 years, but when you've mastered a triple pirouette, you don't stop, you keep going. Sure. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think about um, here the training data as a form of um, kind of an extension of the oral tradition of, of dance performance. And like you're saying, you know, we, we train for years, decades in the service of per a particular technique or particular movements within a technique um, so as to uh, sort of never stop expanding our, our performative regimen. Um, but I guess I'm really interested in 
when the training data looks most like itself, or like when a robot performing looks most like a robot as opposed to a kind of skeuomorphic extension of the human who choreographed it. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, there's a lot of, uh, I'm thinking here of the Boston Dynamics Atlas uh, robots, which are bipedal and vaguely, you know, humanoid. Um, and we, we've seen a lot of footage of these dancing like a person would. Um, but I, I wonder what it means then for these robots to extend beyond either their choreography or training data to dance as a robot would. Um, and I'm not actually sure how a robot would dance of its own accord. And there's, of course, questions of agency sort of baked into that. Um, but you can, you can start to see within certain robotic, uh, Corey robotic performances, uh, movements that cannot necessarily be traced back to a human origin or to something that looks like a human would do. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that I find really interesting, or like I'm, I'm starting to chase robots that seem to be dancing like themselves. And perhaps there's no difference from a, a robot that seems to dance like itself and a robot actually doing it. Hmm. No, I really like this line of thinking because it, it, it comes back to what we were, we were talking about earlier about the idea of that, that maybe there's some kind of new art form that um, can emerge here that, you know, in the analogy with photography, that rather than being the end of, of painting, actually, really, as, uh, as Blaise pointed out, you know, Walter Benjamin, Talk about this idea that it really created a, a, the, the basis for an entirely new art forms, which were conceptual art. And so what, would, what will that be in this case? And I think in the case of motion, it's really interesting because you're saying if we, can, if we can build in some element of, of, of improv, we can sort of see what it does of its own. But all machines do have this kind of natural resonances, so it'd be very interesting to see. I, we were talking a little bit last night about this idea that it seems to me that the, a lot of the dances look really um, awkward, um, that they look, you know, kind of like the white man dancing, the, you know, they're just very, um, they're approximate, um, and they don't seem to really groove in a natural way. So it'd be interesting to see, and I think your point about the sim to real, Katie, is that, um, that, that something is always lost. And, there's actually very good choreography and simulation in all of animation, right? We know that that can be done very in very interesting ways and actually create animals that move like animals, right? That, that actually you can do a lot, but bringing that into the realm of a, robo of a robot, there's a lot of limitations. And that's something that I, I think all roboticists feel because people have grown up with science fiction. They see all these things moving around and then they, um, they expect that that's what they're going to get. Um, and the real robots rarely can live up to that. So what is, how do we handle that gap, that sim to real gap, and think about what robots can do? And then maybe that's going to be a new form of dance, a new form of expression. And that, that, that really intrigues me. I think it's something that maybe we can all think about. It comes back to this point about how can the arts impact AI, but thinking about what could AI actually spur as it, as, it, as, it, as it limits us, but it can also now expand in new directions. Ken, you said something earlier about AI meets the mind-body problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have found, just in my own experience performing with robots, when you're dancing alongside this very complex system, there's sort of this mysticism that emerges because it's like an amalgamation of so many different sensors and motors and compute. And, we talk about this in the moment of performance, this risk that happens on stage because of the interplay between the audience and the mm. people. And I would argue that that could extend slightly to this interplay between the human and the robot. And so this kind of general mysticism and complexity that comes about when you have a very complex system like a robot interacting with a human, I think we're sort of observing something similar, at least when some of the panelists earlier were talking about, is, is this creative? You know, Who's the author of some of the things that are coming out of uh, Mid-journey and some of these other generative models. So maybe you could speak to the mysticism of the body and the mysticism of the body relative to other bodies that seem to emerge in ways that may be similar or dissimilar than our own. Mm. <laughs> Go with the mysticism. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I love that question. Um, you know, because you know, mysticism and opacity are tactics for control, mm. right? And so even as we might you know, uh, be in awe uh, on some level of the creative output of these computational systems, um, this is a new kind of marketing language around black box systems that we cannot access or understand by design. Mm -hmm. It's not because there's, I mean, they, they are obviously super complicated, but it's, they are nonetheless fashioned by people through systems and institutions and corporations. Like they come from a place. 
the places and the histories of these things can be understood. They are grokkable and metabolizable. And so the, the, the aura around these things, uh, and I'm <laughs> using a kind of uh, fey flippant hand gesture of a vague sort of fossey um, <laughs> gesture. That was for my mother who's watching. Hi, mom. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the opacity as a tactic is a choice. It's a choice. Mm -hmm. And while, mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's a similar kind of line of thinking around the cult of the genius artist which is about usually um, you know, white men who are so good, so, have so mastered their material that they are able to output uh, you know, phenomenal art after phenomenal art after phenomenal art. Um, this also is a, a tactical opacity that uh, traffics in the reification of a certain racial logic. Um, and the, the, the coincidence of these things is not lost on me. Mm. I also, I think there's, um, the other part of mysticism I think is this idea of, ex I think of exoticism. And, um, and so sort of uh, um, Orientalism, which Absolutely. has this idea that we, we create this imaginary um, projections onto these things, that we, we project, um, you know, there could be degradation or, or um, derogatory positions, but also um, elevated uh, positions that are, um, are really are from our imagination, not, not intrinsic. And so I think that, that that happens very much in the realm of um, generative AI. Um, I think about that when you say looking at a, a robot and trying to really um, infer, or I mean, see, you're in a unique position, I think, Katie, because you, you, know, you really have tr worked with these things and think about it from a very deep level of how do I respond to this motion and how do your, as you, as you would say, someone comes from a different culture and they come into the dance floor and you are, see someone dancing in a completely different way. And there's a, there may be some people would reject that and just say that person shouldn't be here. But you, I think you would react of what are they doing and how can I, you know, what can I learn from this? And that's kind of what I'm trying to sort of argue here in general that there's so, many, so much opportunity at the same time along with the risk. I think that's excellent, and I think this sort of, as you know, as an artist, I was loving Blaze's point earlier because I think all of the art that I make now, I wouldn't be able to do without AI and with robots that can use AI systems to be able to perceive the world in a way that's sophisticated and safe for me to interact with. And so I love what you said too, Sydney, about maybe we're observing a new art form or the creation of a kind of robot dancing or robot movement that seems somehow different than this kind of Western, balletic, postmodern New York world that we've, we've both been in. Um, and then I just want to ask one more quick question and then we can take some Q&A from, oh, oh, we have less than five minutes. Who has, oh, there's a sign. Really? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Okay, some, somehow myopic. That was my narrow tunnel to Stephen. Okay, um, so let's take some questions from the audience. Does anybody have a question? Stunned silence. Yeah. <laughs> or a dance move. Um, we have one in yeah. the back. Yes, please. Let's take one in the back. So I have a question. Um, as we know that dancing is normally sometimes not just one person, but sometimes two persons. Sometimes you have to have a share centered. So do you have any animation with shared center for two robots dancing together? Because sometimes it's just interaction between male and female to have that kind of expression. So do you have anything on the oven for that? Mm. Um, thank you for your question. Yes, I, you know, they, um, these robots in virtual spaces especially uh, can be mapped to have a shared or distributed center of weight. Um, I'll say that you know, my, my terminal degree, which for some reason is no longer offered anymore, is in contact improvisation um, and postmodern <laughs> And postmodern compositional techniques. NYU was like, yeah, we're going to yeat that. <laughs> um, but uh, all, all to say that um, my particular uh, dancerly expertise is, in fact, in the weight distribution, mm -hmm. the improvised weight distribution across bodies. Um, and so my impulse when I first uh, came into Stephanie Telex's lab um, and started thinking about what it meant to choreograph on these things in, 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 a, in an improvisatory manner mm. was to immediately get them to shift their center of balances towards one another. And I was told, no. <laughs> um, and then I was like, well, can we stack them on top of each other? And I was told, no. 
Um, and so, you know, this is something that we are working towards. Um, you know, there are ways that these robots are in their increasing dexterity and capacity to improvise, are able to dynamically shift their weight in uh, choreographically sophisticated manners. Um, it is also, however, extremely dangerous most mm -hmm. of the time, and a lot of the safety protocols that have been uh, designed to um, make sure that, you know, you don't get fingers amputated or whatever are then put into some kind of flux when a robot's uh, center of balance is uh, intentionally destabilized. We're working on it. Mm. Right. I mean, I think that, like, I, I, you were talking last night because a palabolus or something like where, where you see those kind of those motions and they're so complex and you just feel all the, the nuances. And if you can pull that off with robots, that's going to be fantastic, Sydney. I would love to see that. One more question. We've got another person in the back. Yeah. Uh, when AI as a tool, what do you expect a uh, word processor for choreography that how can you design the move, even though the human body weight distribution, and then make a more expressive limit? Mm. Katie, you have been, you want to take that? Oh, I'm, <laughs> I don't think I should take the question. Yeah. Um, I think transformers will be able to be applied to motion data as well. And the challenge right now is how do we actually capture motion that's slightly more expressive than XYZ joint positions over time and be able to interpolate between two people, especially that are conversing. But I think there's a very, like Ms. Sydney showed the example from Karen Liu, Edge, there's already a lot of research that's happening in this domain. And I think refining the transformers and being able to apply them to motion data, whether it's human, 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 robot, 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 is very weeks, weeks, months, people are already thinking about it. But say other things. No, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. Because the transformer model, which is the, at the root of this new wave, is, is about sequential. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, phenomena, so the sequence, sequence of words, right? So the sequence of motions is, seems very natural and very fitting to that. And I, I think the question, the question is data. Mm -hmm. So will we be able to collect enough data? But maybe by re, uh, again, looking at old videos and extracting three-dimensional motion from that, we can. So it's a really interesting idea. One more question on the hallway, or in the aisle. Yeah. Oh. oh. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I guess Congrats I'm on your project. Me? Oh, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. I guess I'm curious. I think a lot of these robots are genderless and raceless, and slash when they are gendered, they're kind of female. Um, what do you think is going to happen as like positives and negatives as we start to see these like humanoid robots have faces and kind of um, actually like start to look like people and then maybe do cultural, cultural things that are different than what they look like? Mm. Well, that's my favorite topic, which is um, Uncanny Valley. So if you know, I mean, everybody knows what Uncanny Valley is? Yes? Oh, it's this idea that as robots become more human-like, more, more familiar, they, they actually can have a negative result, and we, we get creeped out by them. And uh, it's actually, the creeping part is, is actually comes from Sigmund Freud's concept of uh, unheimlich or uh, uncanniness, which is really interesting. If you want to dig into that, there's entire libraries written about um, Freud's uncanny. So how that plays into robots and their design and their motions and their voices and their, you know, e there's an uncanny sense that you probably, everyone in here has felt when you tried ChatGPT for the first time. There's an uncanny moment when it's, mm -hmm. it's doing something that's uh, what I call too close for comfort. And so that's a big issue that people are, we're going to have to figure out as we, as we continue to design these things. My 15 second response would be that, you know, there's, there's a conception that gender is about genitals and that race is about color. Mm. Um, and I would suggest that using an aperture like performance studies or the humanities maybe more broadly, there's ways that we can understand the interpolations of uh, questions of gender and its representation, questions of race and its representation through robotic bodies that are, again, tactically understood to be genderless and uh, unraced. Mm -hmm. um, they are, are, in fact, neither. Mm. Nice. Okay. Thank you both Thank so you. much. <laughs>